Welcome to EPL Insights for Game Week 28 in the English Premier League. Gareth Wheeler, Jake Osgathorpe with you. This podcast has its data provided by InfoGoal. Just a short slate this week, just seven games to break down, which means Jake and I will be long-winded as usual and probably take the better part of the next two hours to break down just seven games. That's generally how we roll, isn't it? Generally, yeah, we we you know we've got quite a few interesting insights we want to try and get across. We like a little bit of an argument as well, just to uh, to add to that. But, but yeah, it's you know we've got a little bit of extra wiggle room this week, which is nice. Right, and and we might as well make the most of it because coming out of this week's fixtures, we head into the international break, so we won't have Premier League football until the first week of April. So there'll be a little bit of a gap here. Uh, Of course, there's a little bit of a limited slate this weekend because FA Cup games are going to be played as well. And all those bets and the lines are available on Pinnacle as well. So for the latest on that, go to the Pinnacle website, betting resources section. They'll always keep you up to speed. But for the purposes of this podcast, it's Premier League specific. So we're just going to deal with the seven games. And we're coming off a week, which it was a tricky one because on paper last week in game week 27, There were a lot of plays that we liked and there were a lot of plays that were on course until something wacky or weird would play out. It's just typical sport, isn't it? Um, I did come away with some decent plays last week. Bournemouth on the handicap against Liverpool on the plus. That was a good one. Leeds Brighton over. I I proclaimed how much I love playing overs for for both those sides. And Chelsea came away with an outright victory. Who knew they could actually do that in the Premier League? In fact, they've strung together a couple wins in a row. So it it wasn't all for naught last week, but it was a difficult one considering how hot we have been cooking over the course of 2023. It was. Um, yeah, you get days like that or weekends like that. You know, it, <clears throat> those kind of the kind of run we've been on since the start of the year or since the World Cup break, never going um, to continue to be that hot and to generate a profit. What, how, I don't know how many weeks it's been now, maybe 10 weeks. Um, you're always going to get one week eventually. Maybe, you know, we might get back to back, but. All, all we try and do is just put up plays that, that we think are value and that long-term, if you back them week in, week out, you're going to make a profit. And and to be fair, like like you said, we liked pretty much all the bets we put up. Like I, I, I like I said last week, I looked at the slate and thought, wow, this is, I, I, I can see six bets straight away I really like. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I would take the same bets again and, and same prices, the same lines. So, um, yeah, one of those weeks. It, thankfully, the um, you know the most of the damage for me was done in the three pm games, um, but after that, it kind of you know we, we kind of arrested the slide a little bit. We had uh, Crystal Palace not to score against Man City, which came in at a nice number, uh, and the overs in the Fulham game as well, which cashed pretty easy, first half winner. So um, yeah, it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. It was a bit of damage limitation on the Sunday, but um, you know we go again this week, smaller slate, less to focus on but still some uh, some good betting opportunities. Some some big numbers played last week. The Bournemouth outright win over Liverpool, plus 597 on Pinnacle. If you played the 1-0 victory specifically, plus 2107. Manchester United drawing Southampton, the Casemiro sending off. Poor guy, doesn't get a sending off in his entire Real Madrid career. VAR's got him twice for for playing for Manchester United. That obviously impacted the game, which turned out to be a very entertaining, very watchable goalless draw. But the draw played at five plus five thirty three between United and Southampton. If you like the goalless draw, plus twenty one twenty four. And Everton plus 170 to beat Brentford coming away with the one nil victory. And in the words of Sean Dyche, just do your job. And there's an expletive thrown in there as well. So we're going to try to do that this week. So we'll go through our feature five, go rapid fire for our final two and look ahead to some of the futures plays as well. So let's start things off with Friday night football. It's St. Patrick's day. Will you be wearing green drinking a lot of Guinness there, Jake? Oh, um, good question. We have got a a post Cheltenham office party. So there'll be definitely some drink uh, being consumed, whether I'll be wearing green or not. No, I think I'll have navy blue on actually. So um yeah, okay. apologies to all you St. Patrick <laughs> fans. <laughs> but um but yeah, it's 
Yeah, it's a good way to start the weekend. I think it's a good I'll, game. I'll, I'll, I'll still put it on Jake minus 200. Might have a change of heart. Might be end up wearing green anyways <laughs> come Friday. Uh, and while you're having your pints, it's Nottingham Forest and Newcastle. Forest coming off a 3-1 loss at Spurs, but Forest away. They're an absolute nightmare, so it shouldn't surprise. The XG in that game, according to InfoGoal, 1.73 to 1.65. They're down to 14th in the table on 26 points, but they do have a game in hand on Palace and and Wolves, who are just a point better. Overall, Forest hasn't won a game in their last five, no clean sheet in their last five, and they've been the first to concede in their last five games in eight of nine overall. However, playing at home this week, that means good things generally. They're undefeated in their last nine in the Premier League at home, 5-5-3 five, five, and three overall, 17 and 15 in terms of goals scored and goals conceded. Newcastle. 2-1 victory over Wolves, and they needed that win. And the XG was convincing as well, 2.51 to 0.87. Callum Wilson, Miguel Almiron were dropped for that game because it was their first win in six. Eddie Howe needed to do something, and there was a response in the team. Uh, no clean sheet in seven. They've played to the under two and a half in six of their last seven. They are winless, Newcastle, in their last six away from home in all competitions, four, six, and two overall, 16 goals scored and nine against against they are fifth in the table and still four points back at spurs with two games in hand so it's a decent place to chase from especially considering spurs wobbly form joe linton suspended this weekend anthony gordon out through injury head-to-head -head, newcastle won the the game it was the first match of the season it was a 2-0 victory Forest, no clean sheets in their last seven against Newcastle. And in this matchup, they've gone over the total of, of two and a half in five of six. Both teams to score is played in five of six as well. So not a good Forest has been a popular home play, especially on the handicap. Newcastle have all of a sudden started to concede goals, Jake. What do you make of this fixture? Um, yeah, it's, it's a game I've struggled with, to be fair, to find a, an angle that I liked. Um, the reason being, obviously, you've highlighted there, Newcastle are looking a little bit shaky at the minute. Um, they're not looking as solid at the back. Obviously, the the <clears throat> chance creation issues or the chance um, conversion issues are still there. You know, they're not scoring at a really high rate um, compared to their expected goals. But then on the flip side, you know, you've, you've got a Forest team who are really good at home. You know, they're... they're process is, is steady the results have been really good but they're also missing quite a few big players for this um I think Brennan Johnson's out which is a huge miss um you know I, I think if if I was to make a pro forest play I would be looking at um you know I'd want him to be in there because I think he's their best player best forward player most aggressive presser um and best player on the counter-attack so yeah I you know I, I've kind of talked my way around to no bet here because I, I I just think there's a too many question marks around both teams. The goal line did look um interesting. It's moved slightly. Um we're at under two and a quarter right now. I probably would want two and a half um to be a little bit of a bigger price to be back in it just purely because of uh of the way Newcastle have been defending of late, which has been um a lot worse than what we saw at the start uh post World Cup. So yeah I'm happy to just leave this alone. Um Enjoy the Friday night. I don't think I'll be watching this because there's actually a bigger game on. Um, Sheffield Wednesday are playing Bolton for anybody who wants to uh, tune into the Mighty Owls. Um, do, you, but, do you have a play yeah. on that game that you want to share? Uh, yeah, Sheffield Wednesday win to nil. Uh, we don't concede. Okay. Have you have you got a play in the Premier League? I do have a play. And you know how I've been on a massive fade for months in Nottingham Forest. I'm jumping back on the Forest <laughs> train for one week and one week only. I, I like them at home. I know no Johnson. And that's actually taken me off the over because I kind of felt like there was goals in this game. But no Johnson means I'm not going to make that play. The over two and a half, by the way, is at plus 112, which is intriguing because, like I said, Newcastle, no clean cheats in the last seven games. They're looking a little bit more shaky defensively. And, and Forest are a much more progressive team. They play much better at home. And I think that they're good enough to come away with something. Uh, like Newcastle have drawn six, six of their 12 away matches in the Premier League. 
this is where they're draw castle. So I think there's some value playing, making a play on the handicap. And I typically wouldn't play like, you know, a, a 0.75 or a 0.25, but I'm going to do it here. Um, so Nottingham Forest on the handicap at plus 0.75, and it's coming in at a plus number at plus 102. So if they win or draw, you win your full bet. If they end up losing by a goal, uh, you, you end up only losing half your bet. So that makes a lot of sense for me, that little bit of insurance policy here. Look, Forrest to be an excellent at home. Like they're the top half of the table at home. That's the reason why they're they're out of the relegation zone. So I'm, I'm going to remain and, and still have faith. Remember over that stretch, I mean, the, the, the nine undefeated at home, like they, they played Liverpool, they played City, they played some really good teams. And the way that Newcastle's been playing, it's it's not full of confidence, is it, these days? So, and, and how's tinkering? We'll see. Um, you know, perhaps Newcastle can come away with a win by a goal. But, I, I mean, if I get half my stake back, back I think it's worth a, a worth a shot in this game. So, let's go Nottingham Forest on the handicap here. Yeah, I uh, I look forward to you backing again, Nottingham Forest, when we come back from the, from the international break. It's it's about time that I've jumped on board. Like it, it's it's nothing personal. It's just I, so many changes in this team. I don't fully rate them, but um, at home that you cannot deny how good their results have actually been. So l- let's roll with them. Um, moving on to the Saturday fixtures: Brentford and Leicester City. Brentford coming off a one 0 loss at Everton on the weekend. Respond with a two 0 victory at Southampton on Wednesday night. Uh, the XG battles in both games, 2.05 to 2.08, 0. 0.43 to point or 1.83. So they come out on top in both of those in three points and with three points in the process. Um, Brentford are eighth place on 41 points, and they're only three points back of fifth place Newcastle. They're within striking distance here of potentially securing European football next season. They played to under the two and a half goal total in four of their last five games. They're undefeated in nine at home since September. Uh, their last and only home loss came to Arsenal. They're seven, five, and one at home, and the sixth most uh, points uh, in terms of their home record on the season. Leicester City, man, they go up and down, don't don't they? Like a yo-yo. When they're good, they're really good. When they're bad, they're really bad. Three-one home loss to Chelsea. Woot face was sent off. Two yellows. He's suspended this weekend. Uh, they did do well in the XG 2.22 to 1.54 against Chelsea, 17 shots and seven on target. They simply couldn't capitalize and conceding two second half goals buried their chances of coming away with anything. They were tied in 16th, only goal differential keeping them out of the drop zone. They're level on points with 17th place West Ham and 18th place Bournemouth. They've lost now five straight in all competitions. No clean sheet in their last seven games. They've gone over the total of two and a half and five of seven and have been first to concede in seven of seven. Away from home on the season, in the Premier League season, four wins, no draws, nine losses. The 27.6 expected goals against, according to InfoGoal, uh, in 13 games is the worst in the Premier League. Dead last. They have the sixth best expected goals away from home, however, and 21 goals scored away is the fourth most in that category. Face Christensen and Thielmans are all, all out through injury for Leicester City. Uh, face obviously suspended. Head to head, they played to a 2 2 draw uh, last time out. They were up 2 0 in that game and ended up conceding twice to Brentford in the second half in that match. Leicester City hasn't lost in five to Brentford, but they haven't picked up a clean sheet in four. Brentford, no clean sheet in five. Mm -hmm. And these two sides have gone over the total of two and a half in four of five. And both teams to score has played in four of five. I actually have two plays in this game, but I'll let you bat lead off here. What, if anything, do you like in this game? Yeah, I have a feeling you're one of your plays with the same as mine, (laughs) which is a, it's kind of a staple of the podcast, isn't it? Is Brentford to win when they're playing at home and they're a decent number against an inferior team. And that's exactly what we've got. Um, surprise, well, not surprisingly, but the line's actually moved. Um, it was plus 101 literally about two hours ago when I was doing my notes. It's now into the minus, minus 102. So I would say get on this as soon as you can because I don't think this price is going to hold. It's going to keep going. It's going to keep shortening. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they went off around minus 115 kind of mark. Um 
you know, they deserve to be that price because there is a big gulf in quality between these two teams right now. Um, you know, they, they got beat for the first time in 13, you know, 12 games unbeaten, and then they lose to Everton, bounce back really impressively, but they do do the best work at home. Um, yeah, expected goals process is fantastic. 1.9 expected goals for, 1.3 expected goals against per game. Um, and yeah, like one seven drawn five lost one is a very very strong record, and and that process shows that it's no fluke. Like these results are deserved. It's not like they're you know being lucky on their way to picking up that many points. Um, and then yeah, visitors this time are Leicester, and that as you said, they're really struggling at the moment. They've lost four straight. They are looking over the shoulders out of the goal if, uh, out of the relegation zone on just goal difference, which I think is interesting to keep an eye on. Um, just for the for the outright plays. Um, but yeah, they their underlying data has been relegation worthy for a long time now. Something I've been banging the gr- the drum for um, since mid mid season last season. Um, away from home, lost nine of thirteen, and and as you as you pointed out, they're the worst defensive team when travelling in the entire Premier League. So no team has allowed more expected goals against per game than Leicester. And Leicester at two point one two. So. Yeah, there's a lot of things to like, you know, that just the general form um, of the home and the home and away sides, the underlying numbers stack up as well. Um, you know, league position as well. You've got a team in eighth against a team that are in a relegation battle. So yeah, the the price looks big to me. Um, you know, I know it's a, it's minus one oh two now, but it looks a big price still. And I, I would be jumping on it as soon as you can. I was going to ask you about this. Do you have any data on teams that play midweek away going on and playing a team on the weekend who's had the benefit of having the entire week off to prepare, to rest up, to rejuvenate? Because that's the circumstance here. That would be the only thing that might be, you know, having people potentially shy away from a Brentford outright home win here. Um, there's no, no data on that, no. Uh, but I would caveat that with, is it not better for them to come into this game on the back of a win in midweek than to come back off uh, of a defeat the week before, you know, like from a mental psyche perspective, they're back on the horse with a win at Southampton heading into the Leicester game. If not, then they're going into it on the back of a defeat. You know, I guess it's, it's kind of the same, isn't it? But um, yeah, there's, there's no real data. I think the squads are big enough nowadays. They've got five subs to make as well. Um, so if, if players do get tired, they can freshen things up um, early in the in the second half, maybe even at half time, if things aren't going to plan. Um, and yeah, it is the final game before a two week international break as well. So players won't be holding back; they won't be leaving right. anything out there. Um, and yeah, ultimately, the Brentford are just the better team. Um, and as you said, I think Leicester, the, some of their mi- missing players are. Really important. I mean, Wout Feist has been really good at centre half since he's come in. Um, you know, he's looked very solid. Now he's had a couple of dodgy games here and there, but generally he's he's looked pretty good. Um, yeah, it's it, it's almost we keep we say this every time Brentford are at home against a, a beatable team, but it the price just looks too big. It looks too good to be true. And um, yeah, it's almost an automatic bet for me. Brentford against <laughs> anybody at anybody in the bottom half at home is yeah. Take just just place it automatic. It, it it has been that for months now. Yeah, that, the odds have changed. Uh, I had a Brentford at even odds. And now it's at minus one hundred two. I've just was double checking both my both my bets, and I, it's it's gone to minus one hundred six. So by the time you listen to this, I'm not sure where it'll end up, but the money's coming in on Brentford, and it's only going one direction here. So is there a number that you would stop making that play at, Jake? Um, yeah, probably around the minus 115 is probably where I'd stop. Um, so there's a, there's a fair bit of wiggle room right now. We're at minus 102. So, I mean, I, I locked in my play already at even money. So, um, so that's what, but I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, that's, that's some good advice because, um, yeah, I, I also, I just should throw this out there. I also like the over in this game. Over, over. The under chant didn't work last week. <laughs> no, so let's try it. No. Over, over. Um, look, Leicester City, one of my favorite over teams. We said it, no team in terms of expected goals against um, concedes more chances than, than Leicester City away from home. Right. They lose their center back. Ivan Tony. I mean, I don't even know if it's quietly having a great season. He's second in the Premier League in scoring. Only Harry Kane has scored more goals. And I know that they've con- 
consistently played to the under, but the XG numbers for Brentford still look very good, very promising. There's yeah. also a play. If So I, I like the over two and a half at minus 113, but if you like over Brentford goals in the game of a goal and a half at minus 107, I would recommend that play as well. I, I think that Leicester City can score. Um, I think they're going to be a little bit of like of a wounded animal here. They need to turn things around. They've lost five straight. They're right in this relegation battle. So, and, and they do have some dangerous players in attack. It's sad watching Jamie Vardy play these days. He's just, just not the player that he was. But th- there's there's enough creative aspects in this team that they can go on and mm. and, and at least challenge Brentford. So. Uh, those are the three recommended plays. I'll make the two straight up on Brentford to to, Vic, to win, as well as over the total of two and a half. Yeah, if, if I think I would have an, another play as well myself, which would be Ivan Tony to score any time. Um, Pinnacle don't have the player prop lines up just yet, but um, as soon as they do, take that because yeah, he's a man in form. He's played 10 times since the restart, scored in six of those games. Average 0.63 expected goals per 95, which is actually the fourth best in the league since the restart. I think only Erling Haaland, Eddie Nketiah and Darwin Nunez have outperformed him in that metric. So he's a guy that gets on the end of really good chances regularly. Obviously, the penalty taker as well, which is a huge bonus to it when, you, you know, when you're making a goal scorer play. So, yeah, that, that's definitely something I'd be looking at as well when the line comes up. Well, especially when Leicester City don't have their center back, don't have their preferred left back in Christensen, their goalkeeper for me, one of the worst three in the Premier <laughs> League. You never know what to expect. Um, with Tony taking pens, I, I think that that um, gives you that much more reason to make an Ivan Tony play this weekend. So lots to like about that game um, upcoming on Saturday. Let's keep things going. Southampton hosting Spurs. Uh, the Saints back at the bottom. The very familiar position for them on this season after a 2 0 loss to Brentford on Wednesday, although they did pick up a point at Old Trafford in a goalless draw. Um, they're on 22 points. Southampton have played to the under two and a half in five of six, just two, three, and eight at home, the fewest points in the Premier League at home. But they're more of a bottom third team rather than a bottom team in terms of expected goals and expected goals against at home on the season. Something to keep in mind as they welcome Spurs to St. Mary's and Spurs ended a miserable streak where they lost to Sheffield United, lost to Wolves, lost to AC Milan. They did bounce bounce back with a 3-1 victory over Nottingham Forest, a 1.73 to 1.65 XG in that game. Harry Kane came away with a brace. Uh, they played to the under two and a half, not in that game on the weekend, but they have played to under two and a half in six of the last seven. They've lost their last four away games in all competitions, including games to Leicester City and Wolves in the Premier League. They're five, three and five away from home, and they have a minus 1.2 expected goal differential, according to InfoGoal. They've scored 20 away from home and conceded 21. That jumps right off the page. Uh, head to head, uh, Spurs won this fixture first game of the season 4 1, crushed them in the X- XG battle in that game. However, Southampton scored first and have scored first against Spurs in four to five games at the last games that they played. Southampton, however, haven't picked up a clean sheet in their last seven against Spurs. Spurs, this is incredible. No clean sheet against Southampton in their last 16 meetings. That's wild. And these two sides have gone over the total of two and a half in five of six. Both teams to score has played in seven of seven. Uh, what do you make of this game? I find it very hard to make a Southampton bet um, these days. It's just... It's a very difficult watch, but Spurs really don't give you a lot of confidence, a lot of belief playing away from home either. Just in general, uh, they don't give you much <laughs> confidence. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to do a rinse and repeat of last week with the uh, under two and a half goals. Under, um, under, 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 under. Yeah, we. You know, it, it didn't change my opinion. They won three one against um, Nottingham Forest, but if you take away the penalties, they managed to create just zero point nine expected goals in that match against an, a Forest team that have shipped two expected goals away from home on average this season. So it was a really subpar effort again in attack. Um, and overall, since the restart, they've averaged just one point one non penalty expected goals for per game, which is horrendously bad. Um, the only good thing is, as I said last week, the defense is looking much stronger. They're shipping 0.84 expected goals against per game since they lost to Man City. So chances either end are really hard to come by at the minute. Um, and then obviously you take into account Southampton, who 
you know, since sacking Nathan Jones, they've tightened things up a little bit. They've tried to play, um, keep games as as tight as possible and just have it decided by moments or fine margins. And, and you know, it's resulted in two wins against, um, well, Chelsea in particular. But in general, like, that's not the, a sustainable way of winning football matches and surviving in the league by, you know, eking out 1-0 wins here or there. Um, that's just not going to cut it. And, Ultimately, they're not creating enough chances to fire them to safety either. Just 0.78 expected goals for per game is what they're averaging since Sellers took charge. Um, so, yeah, two really poor attacking sides going head-to-head. A game again, Southampton will look to keep tight. They'll look to try and you know still be in the game when it gets to the 70th minute. Um, and Spurs have just shown nothing in attack since the restart um, for me to think that they're going to go to Southampton and blow them away. Um, you know that that Spurs price it does look tempting at minus one nineteen, but I just can't trust them. I can't trust them. I wouldn't be surprised if this ended one nil to Southampton, to be honest. Um, but yeah, again, don't trust Southampton enough to take them on the handicap. So I just think chancing or backing against goals is the way to go at minus one eighteen, which I think is a pretty good number. I'd again probably back it down to maybe minus one twenty five. So there's a bit of wiggle room there. I see why you're making that play. The Saints under two and a half in five of six, Spurs under two and a half in six of seven. For whatever reason, what happened last weekend against Nottingham Forest has left a sour taste because I've, I've been very profitable on this season, fading Spurs, like all the way through. I never bought, believed in this team and never bought them. I still don't think they're going to finish top four. We'll get into the futures plays in a few mo- moments time. But last week I was just Spurs, win to nil was like right on <laughs> and and they can see that cheap goal late. Like, I just don't trust this team. It has nothing to do with that one specific. Re- I just don't trust Spurs. And I would typically make that bet, but I don't trust Southampton either. I can't fade them against the worst team in the Premier. League. I just can't do it right now. Watching Southampton play is painful, especially at home. It's a no bet for me. I just have, I, I tried to convince myself both teams to score because you can see Harry Kane scoring in this game. Of course, with the, with the mistakes that are made at the back by Southampton, I can see him being gifted a goal. Um, Southampton just, they've scored the last 16 games against Spurs. I just, so both teams to score, it's available on Pinnacle at minus 107. I just can't convince myself to, to make a play. I wouldn't even bet your money on this, Jake. I just want to stay away from this game in its entirety because I'm not quite sure how this is going to play out. I have no faith in either team. So that tells me best to move on and pick another game. So, Absolutely. Yeah, if there's nothing you fancy, sometimes no bet is the best bet. I, I mean, most teams like Spurs under. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Just this one, I don't. I just don't know why. I just have no faith that that I really truly understand what's going to play out in that game. So, I'm just going to trust my gut and uh, move on to the next fixture, which is Chelsea and Everton. Also on Saturday, Chelsea they've won back to back games, incredible, and they scored goals in them more than one in both the both games. A three one victory over Leicester City. And of course, they beat Dortmund in the Champions League as well. They didn't score more than a goal in a game in the 10 games before these last two. So trending in the right direction, just maybe. That's three wins in a row in all competitions for Chelsea, by the way, which perhaps is a good thing. And in terms of XG, uh, they lost the XG in that battle, but at least they had over one with 1.54 against Leicester City. 10th place. They're still four points out of eighth place. They really have a lot of work to do. Uh, the under two and a half has played in nine of 10. They're six, three and three at home, 14 goals scored and eight against. Although their expected goals against, according to Infigal, is 14.3. So a little bit fortunate from how many goals that they've conceded versus what the actual expected goals against is Sterling Mount and James are all aiming to return this weekend. Keep an eye on what their potential statuses may be. Everton coming off a one nil victory over Brentford. Dwight McNeil scored in the first minute and they held on from there. There were chances both ways, 2.05 to 2.08 in terms of the XG in that game. Uh, Their XG in their last five games it should be pointed out under Sean Deitch, they're not only tighter defensively, but their XG has been pretty decent. 2.19, 1.77, 1.88, 1.60, and the 2.05 last weekend. Although the under two and a half is played in six of their last games. 
six of their last eight games. Um, Everton haven't won away from home in their last nine, but they did draw against Nottingham Forest their last time away. Their 15th place, but just one point above the drop, but just three points out of 12th place as well. So this could really go either way. An important game here this weekend. Just one win away from home. Eight goals scored, 22 conceded. They have the second worst away expected goals against of 27.5 in 13 games. Calvert-Lewin is closing in on return, but we're not quite sure what his status is as of yet. Head-to-head, Chelsea won through a Jorginho penalty. He's moved on to Arsenal earlier this season. It was 1-1 in this fixture last season, and Everton beat Chelsea 1-0 last season at home as well. So Everton has had a little bit of success in this fixture. Uh, They've played to under 2.5 total in each and every one of their last five games. So here we go. It's a big one uh, for both sides this weekend. Uh, Is there a play that you like in this game, Chelsea and Everton? Not really, no. I've, I've not. There's nothing that stands out to me. Uh, I was going to take the unders again. I think the the result last week against Leicester could prove to be a little bit of an anomaly for Chelsea. It was one of those games where they actually looked vulnerable at the, at the back, and I don't think we'll see that too often. So I was going to go with the unders, but then I look at Everton in terms of attack, like you said, and they're creating a lot of good chances. They've averaged 1.7 expected goals for per game since Dyche was appointed. Um, they played Arsenal twice and Liverpool in that time, so it's not you know not had the easiest of schedules, you could say. But they shipped 1.6 expected goals against per game, so we have seen chances at both ends when Everton play, and, and both teams have scored, perhaps being a little bit unlucky not to cash on a, a number of occasions. Um, and obviously, if both teams do score, then the chance of the overs increases quite quite drastically. Um, but yeah, like I said, I do think that that last week was probably an anomaly for Chelsea because since the restart, only Man City have conceded fewer expected goals against per game than Chelsea have. City at 0.86, Chelsea at 1.06. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think we could be in for another vintage tight Chelsea tussle that's won by maybe one goal. Um, but given the way which Everton have been attacking of late, I was quite happy to just swerve this and just give it a, give it a, a, a little bit of a watching brief. Um, yeah, it, none, of, none of the handicaps appealed either. I, if I was to go on the handicap, I'd be taking Everton plus one. I don't think I trust Chelsea to cover a minus one handicap. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's no bet. Sit down, enjoy the football with a beer. The, the line on Pinnacle is begging you to take Everton on the handicap. Plus 109, you get a full goal. Like, are we foolish not to make that play? I mean, especially considering the the total is set at 2.25. So it, what it's telling you is that this game is going to be close, um, cl- closely contested. That plus 109 is jumping off the page, but I, I'm, I'm sticking with the under, Jake, because, and I'm going to move it to two and a half. So under two and a half at minus 126. Like Chelsea is the quintessential underside. Everton, they might be right there in the runners up winning the silver medal for unders. Like this is this is the way that they're built. And although they're creating a lot of chances with no Calvert Lewin, with no natural number nine, no true finisher, that explains a lot to me that their ability to create is more of a product and 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 not and not putting the ball in the back of the net is more of a product of the personnel and attack. And I just don't think that that will change. They're much better from set pieces. I think that that's where some, where some of this is coming from. But in the natural flow of the game, how are they going to break down this Chelsea side? I, I'm, I'm not sure that they will. Um, so we're going to roll with the under. Under with Chelsea is being one of the most profitable plays in the Premier League this season. Um, I'm not going to swerve it, especially when Everton's coming to Stamford Bridge. So the under two and a half. I'm going to watch what that, what that line does because – uh, Everton at a plus number, I think you can very much make the case and see maybe Chelsea coming away with a one nil win in this game uh, or, or a one, one draw. Either one of them would play just fine. Um, so yeah, Everton's been playing better under Deitch and, and I rate them um, Chelsea going to Leicester city, a team that's not in form surviving against Dortmund at time. I'm, I'm, at times, I'm not sure that they've turned the corner. Um and some key players are still trying to return from injury. So I think the context is there to make that play plus one 
I'm like, I'm trying to convince myself into it right now. I'm not going to make it right now. I'm going to watch and wait, but that's one that I would absolutely recommend and not shy away from. Yeah, it's definitely the way I'd be leaning. Um, I know that you can trust Chelsea to cover a goal handicap uh, at, at this moment in time. I don't think they're explosive enough in attack to be able to, you know, score two or three if, if required. But um, yeah, I probably would just, um, like I said, just, just, the unders did tempt me. I have got unders written down um, at the price here. But yeah, just something about Everton's attacking process and the way in which they've been going about the business, especially from set pieces where um, I do think they might be able to cause a few problems for Chelsea. So, yeah, a little bit hesitant to get involved in this one, really. All right. Um, yeah, and, and that's a prime example of the data suggesting that some of these unders might be a little bit off considering the XG and some of the recent games for both Chelsea and Everton. So Jake doing what he does following the numbers here. Um, I'm going to continue to follow the trend. Uh, let's move on to Sunday and league leaders. Arsenal face crystal palace, two teams going in very different directions. Arsenal coming off a three nil victory at Fulham. It wasn't even close. My Fulham bet like it was over after 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and it, it just the XG 0.67 to 2.17 in that game. No losses in six for Arsenal. They've gone over the two and out total in six of seven and being first to score in four of five. They still have a five point league atop the lead atop the table and they're level on games played with 27 games played with Manchester City. 10, 2, and 1 at home. The second most points at home, 34 goals scored, 16 against. The fourth best expected goal differential at home, according to InfoGoal. Um, they are playing at home against Sporting Lisbon on Thursday after they played to a 2 2 draw last week. This podcast is being recorded before it, so the numbers and sentiments reflect. Uh, upon sentiment before that game was played. Eddie and Kedia remains out for Arsenal, but this team has remained ridiculously healthy. I have no problems with managers pointing it out. Seven of their 11 starters have played each and every game this season, started each and every Premier League game this season. And two of the other players, Odegaard's just missed one game and Party's missed five. So this team has been the most consistent of any Premier League side and it's paid off and it's worked well for them. Crystal Palace, oh man, they lost 1-0 to Brighton on Wednesday. They lost 1-0 to City on the weekend. They lost 1-0 to Aston Villa before that. See a trend here? They haven't scored a goal in their last four games and the XG over that span, 0.99. 0.21, 0.21, 1.21. Jake was on this trend before it even started about Crystal Palace going in the wrong direction. Um, no wins in 12 games for Patrick Vieira's side. They played to under two and a half and six of six. They've been the first to concede of five of seven. They still remain somehow in 12th place. And they're on 27 points, but they're just three points above the drop. Two, four, and seven away from home. Nine goals scored, 16 against. They do, however, have the ninth best expected goals against, according to, to Info Goal, away from home at 20.5 in those games. The problem's that much more complicated. Joey Whitworth made his Premier League debut, the 19-year-old goalkeeper on Wednesday, as Gaet and Johnston remain out for this team, and it looks like he'll get the start again this weekend. Going to the Emirates, good luck. Head to head, Arsenal won earlier this season, 2-0, 1.22 uh, 1 to 1.49 was the XG in that game, and Arsenal has been first to score in five of seven. Do you have a play here? I mean, the cards are stacked against Palace, aren't they? I'm not, not really sure how much long this can continue without making a change. Patrick Vieira, um, <clears throat> a little bit of a cat here, having nine lives, 12 I haven't won a game in 12. That's unbelievable for this Palace side. Yeah, it's, uh, you have to think there'll be some serious talks over the international break um, or maybe you know, already gets dismissed after this match. But um, just looking at the numbers, the underlying numbers for Palace are really bad. The actual results aren't that bad. Um, well, they are they are terrible. But what I mean is that when we're looking at handicap betting, they've actually covered the handicap in 10 of their 13 away matches this season. So this one and yeah. a half handicap spread. 
Um, that includes obviously a draw at, uh, at Liverpool. I was on it on Wednesday at Brighton. Yeah that, yeah, that that was my play against Brighton, and they covered. Yeah, Brighton at uh, Villa last time out. City. Um, Brentford, yeah. Man United. Um, yeah, so ba- basically, they're a team that goes places and doesn't get blown out. Um, and then you flip it on its head, and you look at Arsenal. They've actually only covered the the, the one and a half goal handicap in five of their thirteen home matches. And in five of their 10 wins. So if you're taking the wins, for example, you're looking at a 50% strike rate, 50% would be even money. And you're shorter than that for um, Arsenal minus one at minus 114. So, um, yeah, I, I think I might have a small play on Crystal Palace to, um, yeah, on the handicap at plus one and a half. Plus number, um, we're at plus 103. Like I said, the, the data doesn't really um, fully back this up, but it is worth noting that despite Arsenal completely dominating Fulham. Before that, they had looked very vulnerable defensively, um, particularly in home matches, actually. Yeah. So against Bournemouth, Bournemouth had 1.74, Everton 1.77, City obviously 2.42, Brentford 1.86. Um, United scored twice, Newcastle hit 1.08, West Ham. So they, they conceded quite a lot of goals at home, actually. And, and both teams to score is a bet that's landed in quite a lot of their home matches. Um, I see you're nodding. You're probably going to be going for both teams to score then. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my opinion you made is my if case. Both, both teams do score, then I, I think Crystal Palace will cover this this spread. So my, my bet would be on Palace on the spread because they, they've proven that they can go tough places, hang in there, um, and they don't get absolutely blown out. And, you know, they'll, they'll go into this game knowing that a point would be an unbelievable result. Um, and it might be something that saves Vieira's job. They're not... What, what did you call them a couple of weeks ago? Draw Palace. Um, yeah, they, they draw Chris Palace, draw Palace. Draw there you go. Um, yeah, they're, they're they're not they're not afraid to draw. Um, and and you know that that definitely has to come into thinking, especially when you look at what Arsenal did against Bournemouth and how you know they dug themselves a hole and had to climb out of that um, very very late. So it is doable. Teams can go to the Emirates and um, and put up a decent fight. So yeah, I I think Arsenal will probably win by a goal, but I think that the at the plus number that we're getting, Palace to cover the handicap. Looks like a pretty interesting play. Yep. Um, I was tempted by that, but you made my case. Just if we can just replay, re- rewind your podcast <laughs> about just a minute, and Jake will run through all the both teams to score with Arsenal home matches. I, the, the, the exception to the rule is like 4-0 against Everton. Um, Palace hasn't scored in four games. Come on, they're not... This team with like Zaha and some of the attacking players can't go another game without scoring. And with a young goalkeeper who's unproven, I mean, they have to press. Vieira against his former side. I I can see them scoring a goal. I can see Arsenal at least scoring one goal. Give me both teams to score at plus 136. It's a big number too. And, you know, I'm pretty confident Arsenal is going to score. I'm somewhat confident Palace is going to score based upon what's happened in the past. So, um Let's go there. Plus 136 could be a nice little play um, to make in this game. Um, yeah. Thanks for making the case for me, Jake. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and not to completely ruin your case, but I would just be wary of Palace in attack. They've got good players. Um, I think we said it very uh, right at the start of the season, didn't we, when I was expecting them to be much better than what they are. Um, the Elise, the Eze, they've got creative players, but for whatever reason, it's just not clicking. And they're not creating anywhere near enough chances. I think they've averaged... 0.8 expected goals for per game since the restart. And yeah, they're, they're, they're what well, they've scored one, two, three, four, five, six times in 13 games since the restart. And two of them came against Bournemouth. So yeah, that, you know, I think the value is with the both teams to score for sure. I'm with you there. I think, I think that's over uh, being underestimated. Um, the same way as I think Arsenal to win to nil is too short at the, at the price it currently is. But yeah, I, Palace are just, just from a scoring perspective, they're just a team I just cannot trust at the moment. They're just not doing enough. Let, let's see the impact of Thursday night football on uh, Arsenal as well, yeah, heading into the is... weekend. Big game against uh, Sporting Lisbon uh, at home on Thursday. Yeah, you'd have to expect that they probably would be looking to advance in that. They're in a decent position, 2-2 two, two draw away. Um, you've got a couple of weeks international break as well to get people fresh and and, and whatnot. So yeah, you'd, you'd think they'd go back to back strong teams and yeah, could potentially catch them out. 
We'll see. Uh, just two games to go for a quick fire stage here. The podcast, two more games to deal with. And I do have a play on each one. Does Ooh. Jake Oscarthorpe have a play? Aston Villa and Bournemouth. Do you have a play for this game? I do, yeah. I'm going to take both teams to score. Minus 114. Um, it's a bet that's landed in six of seven home matches under Unai Emery. Uh, they're creating a lot of good chances, obviously, Villa, to score in that many games. 1.78 expected goals for per game the last three, which is kind of, it's a small sample size, but they had a, a really tough schedule in the four games prior in which they lost all of them. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the signs are that they're picking things back up again. Um, and Bournemouth obviously caused a massive upset last week, beating Liverpool. But we've said it for a while, the positive results been coming because the performances have been getting better. Um, they've averaged 1.4 expected goals for per game across the last five matches. And while that probably doesn't seem like a, a wow number, it is impressive because they've played four of the current top six and they've yeah. still put up those kind of figures. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Bournemouth get a result, but I just thought both teams to score was a little bit of a safer play given the way in which both teams attack and defend. Right. Um, I'm a fan of the way that Bournemouth has been playing. I can't believe I'm saying it. I think they're good enough to get out of the draw. You've got your Bournemouth colours on as well. I I, I, I do. I'm 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 pro cherries here, and I'm backing them on the handicap of plus point seven five again. I, it, again, I don't typically make these plays, but with the insurance of you know you know a half loss if they lose by a goal to Villa. It, it, it's too good to turn down at minus 103. That's where I locked it in. It's actually moved to minus 106. So I suggest getting on this while you can as well. You mentioned it. Bournemouth has played well and the underlying numbers have looked pretty decent despite overall on the season, season on the balance of it because how bad they were at the beginning of the year away from home. The numbers are completely slanted against them. But in five of their last six games, they played Liverpool, Arsenal, City, Newcastle, and Brighton. I mean, it doesn't get any more difficult than that, does it? And they've been largely competitive in those games. Um, you know, with the exception of the City match, and, and City can beat anyone, crush anyone on their day. Um, I, I like I like Bournemouth. And Bournemouth, by the way, head-to-head -head against Villa, they beat them their last four times that they've played. And Villa haven't come away with a clean sheet over the course of those four games. So give me Bournemouth on the handicap in this game at minus 103, please and thank you. Yeah, no, um, no opposition to me. I definitely can see them getting a result. Um, they are playing at that that level right now. That I think probably should not not frighten, but it should it should make everyone around them in the relegation battle a little bit wary because they are turning the screw a little bit. And it does look as though the signings they made in January are starting to have a bit of an impact good. now. So yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be surprised to see them um, maybe not climb to safety, but hang around longer than we expect. Uh, shout out to Ollie Watkins, by the way, goals in six of his last seven games. There is no team that screams mid table more than Aston Villa. <laughs> Just <laughs> through and through mid table Aston Not Villa. Wrong. Let's finish with a real relegation battle here. It's 13th place Wolves, but th they shouldn't feel comfortable sitting in 13th as they take on Leeds United. Do you have a play in this one? I don't know. Um, I'm quite happy to leave it alone. I thought Wolves were a little bit too short, uh, but Leeds are just not trustworthy enough to back. Um, and then the unders is just extremely short. You know, minus 156 for under two and a half goals, which, yeah, you know, if anything, it might be worth having a having a play on the on the la on the other on on the over at plus 135. Um, you know, just as a as a bit of a value bet, that's probably where I'd go. These games tend to be go one of two ways, don't they? Big six pointers. They tend to be really cagey really tight nil nil one nils um because no one wants to give up any ground or you know like wolves have done a few times actually in these kind of matches they've, they've opened up a little bit and gone for the win because obviously three points against a relegation rival is you know it's, it's, well they call it a six pointer for a reason don't they so yeah if i was to have a bet it would be a small play on the overs but um yeah I'm, I'm quite happy to leave that alone and just stick with the the four bets i've got at the minute uh, both teams to score, yes, at even money. That is my play in this one. Uh, Wolves, the numbers don't look great in home games. 10 goals scored, 15 against. But their XG, as well as the expected goals against, according to InfoGoal, is a full five goals higher. It, it's like a crazy number that they're not scoring or conceding anywhere near the level that they're projected to based upon the data. 
Um, they are scoring goals. They scored against Newcastle. Uh, they, they score against bad teams. Leeds United fits that category. They concede unbelievably poor goals. Tyler Adams is out. That makes their defensive work that much more difficult, especially defending from the midfield, an area that you need to do well against Wolves. But they have more attacking talent, quite frankly, than what Wolves had. They scored two goals last time out uh, against Brighton. Um, they're a side I always generally lean to the over. And their expected goal differential away from home, minus 4.8, it's like right in the mid-table. Like... It, they're, they're not as bad as they should be considering they've only won one game away from home all season. And they already played to a 2-1 victory over Wolves where both teams scored last time they played. And Leeds hasn't had a clean sheet against Wolves, and that's always the worry. Can Wolves score? But Wolves has scored against Leeds their last nine times that they played one another. So both teams to score at even money for me in a game that's critical for both. Uh, it, it seems a good play to make. So And at even money, um, I can get behind that. Any quick thoughts? No, no, I, I definitely was leaning towards the value being with the goals. So, <clears throat> yeah, kind of along, along similar lines there. Let's uh, run through the futures plays as things currently stand. Uh, Premier League title odds, Arsenal minus 140, City at plus 120. Can you see either one of these teams slipping up before they meet again this year? Um, Before they meet again? Uh, I can't, no. Um, I, I think they both got to play Liverpool, which is the, the kind of big-ish fixture that both have got to kind of come through um, before they play in April. But, you know, you look at Arsenal's run, they play obviously Palace at home, they've got Leeds at home after that, then they've got Liverpool away, then West Ham, Southampton. So they've got four really winnable games and then a trip to Anfield. If they pick up 13 points from that run, then they're going to be, you know, in my opinion, in the driver's seat. Um, yeah, City... Like they've got Champions League, FA Cup, all sorts of juggle, which is obviously going to go against them in terms of the fixture pileup. Um, they also play West Ham and Southampton, but they've got a Brighton away, which could be a, a big banana skin for them, the way in which Brighton have been playing. Um, obviously, they just look a really strong side, don't they, in general? But if they're pushing for top four, top six, then that becomes an even bigger game. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think Man City are more likely to drop points over the next um, five or six matches than Arsenal are. But, um, you know, we, we've seen strange things happen, haven't we? Arsenal going away, Everton losing. Um, those kinds of things can happen. And the fixture pile-up, I think, is something to keep an eye on because the Champions League draw is Friday. We're recording this on Thursday. Um, and then, obviously, we'll be able to see where those matches fit in the calendar for, for City and, and how that looks, given that they're also more than likely going to be in the FA Cup semi-final after, if they beat Burnley. And before you know it, you've got an extra three matches to fit in somewhere. And we'll see with Arsenal if they advance in the Europa League and what their draw may deliver. I mean, Arsenal at Anfield, if they can come away with the result there, it just might be a bridge too far to cross in terms of City closing that gap between Arsenal. A critical game coming up in April. Uh, top four, Manchester United, uh, odds of finishing the top four, minus 700. That's despite losing Casemiro yet again. Poor guy, man. Just... It's extremely harsh, the, the sending off. So he's like seven games through suspension, both thanks to VAR. Uh, Spurs at plus 150. Ugh. Liverpool at plus 170. Ugh. They have extremely difficult schedule upcoming. Liverpool do. Uh, Newcastle plus 170. Mm, they have some games in hand. <laughs> Brighton at plus 500. Ugh. I should just be <laughs> judging my sentiment on them based on the sound effects here. Uh, yeah. Plus 500 after their, their, their victory over Crystal Palace midweek. Uh, is Brighton worth, worth a punt here? Because none of the teams above them, other than United, look look at that all convincing right now. And Manchester United look pretty comfortable in that third spot, don't they? It's just really the fourth spot that's up for grabs. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the fourth spot, really, that, that's, that's the main issue. Um, oh, Brighton, I bet. I don't think so. I'd be leaning towards Newcastle, I think, at that plus 170. I just look at Brighton's schedule. It's it's pretty tough. Um, they come back off the break and they play Brentford, which is obviously a pretty tough game. They've, uh, they've got Bournemouth away, Tottenham away, Chelsea away, back to back to back, uh, and then City at home. So they've got you know, three of the big six in consecutive matches and they've still got to go to the Emirates as well. 
Um, and Newcastle is much more straightforward in terms of schedule. They've got all the all the away games against the big six out of the way, so they don't have to worry about those. Um, they just I think they they welcome Arsenal, Spurs, and Man United at to St James's Park. So I, I think the schedule is in Newcastle's favour. Obviously, the current position of the table in the table is is in their favour as well. They've got a two point cushion on Brighton, um, and they're only four behind Spurs with games in hand. Yeah, it's it's all going to come down to those head to head meetings, I think, because Spurs have have got to play both of them, um, and they've got to play Liverpool as well. So, yeah, those head to head clashes could prove really important. I I personally would I've not really changed my stance. I've been on the Newcastle top four bandwagon f- um, ever since the was it maybe three or four weeks before the World Cup. Once the underlying data was actually suggesting that they could or they are performing like a top four team. Um, yeah, that's definitely where I'd be looking uh, at, at, the, at the moment. That plus 170 looks a little bit big. I'd probably have them a bit shorter than Liverpool, to be honest. Hmm. And finally, the relegation battle. I mean, this, could if anybody, you have yeah. a feel on this, then this could be potentially a profitable venture for you. On Pinnacle, the odds for relegation, Southampton are odds on minus 250. Bournemouth minus 145, Nottingham Forest plus 125, Everton plus 137, Leeds plus 150, Leicester City plus 325, West Ham plus 400, Wolves plus 550, Crystal Palace 550. There are eight teams right in the thing, like 12th place down to 20th, Jake. I mean, you can make a case for each and every one. Is there anything that you see on the board that intrigues you? Yeah, that that Palace number, it still looks big. Um, I've been banging the drum for a while now about Palace, the fact that they are in the relegation scrap. I think when I started talking about them, they were still 12th, funnily enough. I don't think they've moved from 12th since the start of the season. Um, But yeah, they they had about a 10-point cushion at that stage, and it's slowly been whittled down to just three points. Um, And the teams below them have got games in hand as well. So um, I do think that plus number is is definitely worth taking on um, just purely because their underlying data is rubbish. They rank as the the third worst team in the league based on expected points. The schedule is really interesting for Palace because they actually play, they, they, they play Arsenal obviously this week, but then when they come back from the international break, they've got five games, one, two, three, four, five, six games against teams around them in the table back to back to back. So they play Leicester, they play Leeds, they play Southampton, Everton, Wolves, West Ham, like consecutively. If they have a bad run of form during that six-game period, they are going down because they can't afford to, A, lose too many more matches, but also lose to rivals. Um, So that's really interesting. And then they finish the season with Bournemouth, Fulham and Forest. So again, two more teams that are down there with them. So effectively, all eight teams underneath Palace, they've got to play them all, which is going to make or break their season. And... I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the break. If they do make a managerial change, this is the time to do it because you couldn't ask for kind of better fixtures. Two wins in, in you know, if they if they beat Leicester and Leeds straight back off the bat, they're probably going to be safe. You know, they get to 33 points and Leicester and Leeds are still there on 24 points. You, you know, you'd fancy yourselves to get to at least 36 and I think that might be enough. So, yeah, uh, it's really interesting to see what's going to happen. I think that that number right now at plus five fifty is is definitely still still good for me. Um, you know, Southampton at minus two fifty. I think we're both uh, not on the Bournemouth train, but we think that they're probably they're at minus one forty five. They're probably don't, don't you don't you feel? I, I kind of feel like this exercise is easier easier to pick out who you won't bet on right now. I make won't a relegation bet. On, yeah. bet. Okay, because I, I, think that, so that, I think that I think I think Southampton's going down. I, I, but I think that I think that they're going down, and it's too short. So, yeah. um, I think Bournemouth, I'm, I'm staying away from Bournemouth. I'm staying away short. from Everton. I mean, yeah. I was campaigning for weeks when the odds were bigger on Nottingham Forest to go down. Now they're at plus one twenty five. That number's gone to unplayable for me. Yeah, and I, I think, think the, the, Wolves, the only... I think the Wolves are going to be okay. Um, yeah. I think there's enough points in that team. Good manager. The one that jumps off the page for me is West Ham United. This whole idea that they're too good to go down, they're still playing in Conference League, they have that distraction, and they've been absolutely abysmal. Abysmal to watch. They've picked up six points away from home, Jake. They have a critical game coming out of the international break against Southampton at home. 
After that, Newcastle, Fulham away, Arsenal, Bournemouth away, Liverpool. I just, I, I don't know how many points they're going to pick up from that run of games. They are right in the mix. They're level on, on points, right? It's just goal differential that's keeping them out of the bottom three. This could be one of those weird years where nothing goes right. Nothing comes together. This team doesn't have confidence. They, they, the way they play is absolutely awful to watch. There's an argument there's not enough goals in this team, especially the way they play. Plus 400. I mean, I, I think that that is a playable. It might be a little bit short, but it's something I want to keep an eye on here. They don't play this week. Other game was postponed, so uh, we'll see what that means. But, man, that game, West Ham, Southampton, coming out of the break, if they don't pick up full points at home against Southampton, I think they could be in some real trouble. Yeah, I, I, and I see where you're coming from. I personally, at the prices, will be looking at Leicester instead of West Ham. Sure, um, put them in the mix too. They're, they're slightly sh- slightly shorter, plus three twenty five. But um, you know the data suggests that West Ham are a better team. That they've been a little bit unfortunate, um, and that they will eventually climb out. They might even have a managerial change themselves as well um, during this next international break. So yeah, I, I definitely would be taking a pop at a few big prices for sure because it is that tight down there um, that the value does seem to be with the teams that are kind of sinking. And I think Palace are a team that are sinking. Everyone thinks that they're going to be fine, that they're, you know, they just sat there in 12th. But they've had a really bad run of, uh, of results and everybody's caught them up. Um, and the price doesn't seem to suggest that, which I think is interesting. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I don't I don't think Everton will go. Um, I've just looked at Nottingham Forest's schedule. That's pretty tough, actually. I think they've, they've got 12 games left or 13 games left. They've got six, they've got the big six to play, all of them. Uh, is it all of them? No, they've got Newcastle in there and five of the big six. So I that's think they're not done. I think they're. I think they're done with United. I believe. Um, yeah, it'll be um, the other five, and and uh, no, I think they've got United at home. Do they? They played them in the league. Yeah. So that they they've got a really tough schedule. So um, it might be cha- it might be time to look at potentially Forest, depending on what happens um, this this weekend. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm really looking forward to seeing how it all unfolds, to be honest, because um, usually at this stage of the season, there's one team, usually like a Norwich, that are just like 20 points from safety already gone, whereas now you've actually got wow. five points between eight teams. You could throw a blanket over them. Um, and, you know, you've got some really big head-to-heads coming up, big six-pointers, which are going to be great for cards, um, card backers, because everything gets a little bit on edge the closer we get to the end of the season. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, um, you know, to have so many good battles at this stage of the season, the title obviously is going to go to the wire, the top four, the top six, the relegation. I think it's um, it's set up to be a really, really good finish. Well, yeah, you mentioned it. You're right on United. They have a stretch come mid-April Forest. They play United at home, Liverpool away, Brighton at home, Brentford away. Like <laughs> These next four games, if they can get something this weekend against Newcastle, you take it. Wolves home, Leeds away, Villa away. I mean, those four games, uh, we'll see what happens over that stretch. And their final match of the season, away at Crystal Palace. Could come down to that fixture that decides who's up and who's down. So uh, keep an eye on Pinnacle, uh, the futures bets at pinnacle.com. All of your Premier League plays, the sharpest book, the best lines, um, and of course, all the data on this podcast is provided by InfoGoal as well. Please bet responsibly, and the odds provided are accurate at the time of recording. Uh, have a great weekend, Jay. Uh, you too, Patrick, yeah. Say, Cheltenham Festival going on, a lot going on, uh, and we'll see in a couple of weeks. I'm off to Orlando, Florida to hang with Mickey Mouse and to watch some March Madness <laughs> basketball. Should be great. Very jealous, yeah. With my SPF like 80 sunscreen on. So I'll be ready to go. <laughs> so I've still got three layers on here. It's freezing. So yeah, it's the yeah. same. I need I need some sunshine. I need some warmth. So um uh, enjoy the games this weekend, everyone. Enjoy the international break as well. On behalf of Jake, I am Wheels. Uh, you've been watching and listening to EPL Insights with data provided by InfoGoal. <laughs>